Bibles, would you turn with me to the last book in the Old Testament? Any guesses? No chocolates. I didn't hear anybody. Malachi. Malachi. At least the confirmation kids are loud. All right, the book of Malachi. We're still on our journey of introspection as we go through uh, this period of Lent. Um, we are allowing the Spirit of God to deal with issues in our lives, in our hearts that need to be dealt with. And, uh, uh, and I'd just like to draw your attention to this particular book because it's a, it's a good book. It's a book that uh, kind of draws for us some of the things that are upon God's heart that need to be upon our heart, but we may have missed along the way. Because God is speaking to the priests, to the children of Israel, and he has these indictments, and he says, these are things that have happened in your life. And the, the startling thing is that they look at him and say, how have we done those things? They're quite oblivious to the fact that there has been a crossing of a line in their honoring of God and their giving to God, all the rest of the things. There seems to be a, a kind of, a, of blinders that have settled over people. And that's why I like the spirit of Lent. It, it gives us a time for us to invite the spirit of God to really search our hearts and see if there are things that have just crept in, that have become part of who we are, but part of, not part of who God wants us to be. And as we look at Malachi, look at the questions. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? I've loved you. God says, I've loved you. And the people turn around and say, yeah, but how have you loved us? Those kind of questions. And God says, where is my honor? There's no honor that God is getting. Then he says, you've defiled my altar. And they say, how have we defiled your altar? And then God says, you, you put absolutely rubbish things on my altar, things that I have said I will not accept, and you ask, how, am I, how have we defiled your altar? It seems as if there's such a huge difference between what the people think they're doing and God's expectations. That somehow there's a, there's a, um, a gap that has come, which is an oblivious gap to the people. And as I read that, I thought, this is a good place for us to be in, in our journey through Lent, to be able to ourselves ask the question, are there gaps in the way I think? Do I believe that I'm doing everything that I ought to be doing, and yet when God sees it, He doesn't see it like that? Am I honoring Him? Do I love Him? Look at the other thing. God says, you're, profa you're profaning my word. Are we profaning his word. Then you have turned aside from the way. You, you're going a different way. You've caused many to stumble by the instruction. Another thing you do, you cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and with groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor of your hand. They haven't realized and that's the kind of mindset that can slowly begin to take control of us. That we think that we've got it all together. And yet, from God's perspective, He says, you haven't. There's a big gap between what I expect you to do and what you are doing yourself. How have we wearied Him is another thing. And then, in verse 7 of chapter 3, God says, Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, How shall we return? How shall we return? When you think about it, you think, Is this really a conversation that is going on between God and his people, that they cannot understand? Is it so difficult to understand when God says that you've defiled my altar and they say, how have we defiled? And God says, you put uh, uh, lambs that are 
uh, lame and blind and sick on the altar when it should be an unblemished offering and they don't understand it. Really? And while I looked at this entire Malachi, the book of Malachi, I thought, my goodness, we need to be very, very careful how we too progress through life. That we don't get to a place where we think that we have got it all together. That we get cocky about our faith and think that, you know, I'm doing everything that God wants me to do. I'm in a good place. And maybe today is a good place to start and say, Lord, am I in that place? Am I where you want me to be? Or have I moved? How shall we return? And then in verse 8, I, I actually shudder when I read these lines. Because God says, Will a man rob God? Will a man rob God? Yet, he says, You're robbing me. And then they say, But how have we robbed you? How have we robbed you? And God's answer is, In tithes and offerings. In tithes and offerings. In verse 9, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. So tithes and offerings were not being given. And God says, when you don't give your tithes to the Lord, you are actually robbing God. That's, those are harsh words, isn't it? And I'm glad that you have your Bible open and I have my Bible open, because I'm reading from His Word. You have robbed me, he says, when you don't tithe and give your offering. And then in verse 10, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house and test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Bring the whole tithe, which means whatever is the tithe, bring that into the storehouse. What was the tithe? The tithe is, it's, is not some mystical thing that we uh, talk about. The tithe is a mathematical figure. It just, tithe in Hebrew means ten. One tenth is what it means. So when God is saying, bring the whole tithe, He's saying, don't bring 2% of what you have got. Don't bring 5%. Don't bring 7%. Don't bring 9.99%. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. And then God says this. He throws out this challenge. He says, test me and see whether your storehouses won't overflow because you bring the whole tithe. He says, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Hear me very clearly. I'm not saying tithe so that your, the money will come in. I'm saying tithe because it is God's mandate for you. The consequence of, being, of, of obeying God is always that His blessings come upon us. Are you with me? We don't put money in the bag and say, I'm just waiting for some more money to come. We give it because it belongs to God. That 10% doesn't belong to you, church. It doesn't belong to you. The Bible says that it is holy unto God. It's holy. That 10% we dare not touch. It's holy. It's separate. It belongs to God. And God says, if you obey me, automatically, as I've said before, any time we are in obedience to what God wants us to do, automatically the blessings come. Because that is the very nature of God. 
His blessings come with our obedience. I have preached here at CAP. This would be my fifth sermon on money here at CAP in 20 years. We haven't really preached on this. A couple of years back, I was reading this passage, and I always stop at 10. And then I said, I need to move on and read what is 11th and 12th. And I, I just, after that, felt that I had to speak about this passage. Verse 11 says, then. So the 10, verse 10 is not an end in itself. If you do this, if you tithe, then God says, I will rebuke the devourer. I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes. Today we are not really an agrarian culture, at least in this group. We don't have fields and we don't have wine and wine and all of those things. But God is saying whatever it is that is devouring you, today, that you work and work and work and you, at the end of it you feel, I don't know, there's nothing left. There's nothing left. God's saying, I will rebuke the devourer from you. I will put an end to it. All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. If we just take that passage and look at it and say, is that the word of God? Yes, it is. If it's the word of God, it's relevant for me. Is that okay? <laughs> You're not going to talk to me today, are you? <laughs> the one hand holding onto your wallet. And the <laughs> just listen to me. If this is the word of God, and we say, that we accept the word of God, then it's true for us. Now, let's look at what arguments have been made about this passage from a New Testament perspective. The one that I hear very often is that it's the tithe is based in the law. And the law is not relevant in the New Testament culture. Well, let me tell you this, that the tithe preceded the law by 430 years. The tithe preceded the law by 430 years. Tithe was given by Abraham to Melchizedek 430 years before Moses wrote down the laws for the children of Israel. The tithe was in operation. And Hebrews refers to this not so much in terms of the tithe, but looking at the offerings that were given, and given to a person like Melchizedek, and says, how much more should we give to one who is eternal, we find in Hebrews, who is Jesus Christ. Mel while Melchizedek was a sh foreshadow of the Christ, how much more is the argument? We must give to one who is eternal, the Son of God. That's the first argument that is often raised. The second is that, Tithe is not mentioned in the New Testament, and so we don't really need to follow the tithe. Well, that is also not true because Jesus mentions the tithe. In Matthew 23, 23, he says to the Pharisees, you tithe your common and your grain seeds and all of that, and those you must, those are his words, those you must, I'm not doing away with the tithe, but he says you have forgotten the more important aspects of the law, but he's not touching the tithe. He's not touching anything of the Old Testament. Now, the third is that the New Testament talks about giving cheerfully, without grumbling, and you know that there's nobody is making you compulsively give something. Or, you know, I don't think that Jesus came to lower the bar on tithing so that we could give cheerfully. I really don't believe that. Because if anything. 
He raised the bar in the New Testament on everything. In the Old Testament, it is said that if you commit murder, you are guilty. Jesus said, it is said that if you commit murder, you are guilty. But I say to you, if you are even angry with your brother, he raised the bar. In the Old Testament, it said, do not commit adultery. In the New Testament, it says, if you even look with lust, you have committed adultery. Now ask yourself, would he then, in the context of this, as Paul says, give cheerfully, be in any way reducing what ought to be given to the Lord? Leviticus 27.30, if you want, turn with me there. Leviticus 27.30 Thus, all the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Which means that that is something holy that belongs to God. And beloved, we have no right holding on to it. We have no right holding on to it. I asked somebody once, do you tithe? And he said, yeah, I give about, you know, um, five, six percent of my income. And I said, you're not tithing, you're actually tipping God. Because the tithe is 10 percent. You can't tithe five percent. You can't tithe two percent. And I, I'm speaking... I, Sometimes I get into trouble that you think I'm getting angry and preaching. I'm not. I just feel so burdened by the importance of these words of Scripture that I have to preach it. Because it is in Scripture. And I don't want to stand before a holy God and have to say that people didn't know because I didn't preach. Amos, Hosea 4, 6 says, My people perish for lack of knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. Let it not be said that here at CAP, we didn't have knowledge about what tithing and offering meant. The tithe belongs to the Lord. You've heard me speak when I invite the ushers to come forward. What do I say? I said, let's present to him his tithes and our offerings. His tithes and our offerings. Over the years, beloved, we have just, both Sheila and I and our family have understood what it means to just faithfully tithe. Off the very top, before any deductions, we take out the 10%, we give it to the Lord. And then the offerings are way beyond that. We, we give to Jisuprem, we give everywhere else. But that's the offerings that we offer. But every income that comes into our home gets tithed. Every income, whether it is through our salary or book sales that happen, gets tithed. If it's income, it's tithed. And it's tithed off the top. Don't take away the EMI and other payments that we have to make and then tithe from what's left over. Off the top is what? That's the first fruits, beloved. The first fruits, the first thing that comes in is what God expects. That is holy unto the Lord. And that God takes seriously. I, apart from scripture, where he deals with, Jesus deals with Peter, where he says, get thee behind me, Satan. It seems to me that like, these are kind of the woe, woe unto you, woe unto you, when God says, don't rob me. Don't rob me. Be very careful. It doesn't belong to you. It is holy unto the Lord. Bring the whole tithe, he says, into the storehouse. Bring the whole tithe. When we started CAP, one of the things that we said we will not do was to get up on the pulpit and ask for money every now and then. And we firmly believed that if everybody tithed at CAP, we would never have to ask for money to do any project. To do any project. And that's what we have believed here at CAP since for the last 20 years, that if you're a member of CAP, you automatically tithe. I've had many people who come and say, what is your membership at CAP? He said, we don't have membership. 
We have we tied. We expect you to be regular here. This is not a place that you choose to come two Sundays out of four. You come here four Sundays if you're a member of CAP, because we believe that God meets us here, and that's His requirement. Don't forsake the gathering together of the saints. Is His word. So we take those things seriously rather than have a membership list that says, if I pay X amount of money, I'm a member of CAP. No. And you've heard, you've seen us model that over 20 years or however far your journey has been with us. But if you are a member of CAP and you see yourself as a member, you ought to be tithing. But I'll say this also. If you're visiting, if you're here from some other church, go back to your church and tithe. Go back because it's not, it's something that is biblical that God expects of his children. It's easy sometimes for us to tithe when we get little, isn't it? It's easier to put a thousand rupees and say, okay. But then when God continues to bless and the tithe amount grows, that's when it gets a little more difficult. Do I put 25,000? Do I put 50,000? Do I put a lakh into the offering pay? Two lakhs, because I'm getting blessed. But suddenly we begin to think, oh my goodness, I can't put two lakhs. That's too much to put in. No, it doesn't belong to you. It doesn't belong to you for you to even think, I, I should just put a portion of it here. It belongs to God. It is holy unto the Lord. Don't touch it. And that's the reason that one of the thing, ways in which we have run CAP is to always go to the Lord and say, Lord, is this something that you want us to start? When we started Jesu Prem, we had nothing. But we knew that this was what God wanted us to do. We didn't have the money for Jesu Prem. But we knew that if we know that this is what God wants, He will provide. That's the only thing that we have brought in as a criteria is to find out where God is working and hang on to his coattails. And he will provide everything else. Now, we've taken a new gala, 127. Why did we take it? We're taking it in faith because we believe that the Sunday school children are growing and growing out of the space that we have. No longer can we accommodate them. They're all forced to meet in this one place. There are no rooms. So we've taken another place We'll move our offices there, take less space, have reflections there, and open up this whole area for Sunday school so they each have rooms that they can work with. Because that's what we believe God wants us to do, is to give the children a good environment to learn from Him, learn of Him. But we don't try and do the math to see whether that has happened. We make sure that this is what God wants us to do, and then know that God will give. Will a ra man rob God? It should be a hypothetical question, isn't it? Unfortunately, it's not in the Bible. Will a man rob God? Yes, we've robbed God. I don't know. I can't even imagine. I just think of God as a loving God. That even in the midst of this, when he says, you've robbed me, He's still saying, I'll give you a chance. He's still saying, try it. Try it and see. Because when you are in obedience, in alignment with my holy will, my blessing is upon you. I don't know where you are, church. But we are in this whole Lenten walk where we are just allowing God to speak. And maybe today you're saying, I give a whole lot more than I used to give 10 years ago. That is irrelevant. The point is, are you giving what belongs to God to Him? That is always the point. I believe the New Testament has more to deal with attitude than numbers. Attitude. That's why the Bible talks about give cheerfully. Give cheerfully. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9. 
<coughs> Verse 6. Now this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. As it is written, he scattered abroad, he gave to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply will supply and multiplying your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in everything for all liberality, which through us is producing thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of the service is not only fully supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing through many thanksgivings to God. Because of the proof given by this ministry, they will glorify God for your obedience to your confession of the gospel of Christ and for the liberality of your contribution to them and to all, while they also by prayer on your behalf yearn for you because of the surpassing grace of God in you. Thanks be to God. While I was preaching this morning, I went back to my office after I preached. I felt that there was one area that I ought to have touched on which I didn't. And it's in this area where you're going through a difficult time. Maybe. And maybe it's a lean period in your life. And you have payments that still need to be made. And sometimes you think that the wise decision here is to make the payments first and then give and tithe to the Lord what is remaining. Beloved, don't make that mistake. Whatever you have in terms of income, even if mathematically it doesn't make sense, Give to the Lord and you will see that it will make sense. Give to the Lord first. Give to the Lord first. And you will see how the blessings flow because that too is His word for each one of us. So as we think about it, ask the Lord to just speak to you, beloved. Take away my voice from the midst of all of this. Think about what God is placing on your heart. For I, I, I wouldn't want to stand in the way of anything that I said, standing in the way of you, clearly understanding what God has for you. But then having deciphered that, then make sure that you do it. And do it wholeheartedly as cheerful ones. Let's pray together. Lord, take your word, Master, and again I pray, Lord, if there are things that I have said or my attitude or voice or anything that is getting in the way right now, remove it, Master, and let only your unadulterated word, word fall back upon our hearts, that we may do what is right by you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.